Welcome to this new nutrition business podcast. It's our first podcast for 2024. We last did one, in fact, in November 2023. And, and that's all my fault, because apart from doing this occasionally, I have a business to run. And apart from our Christmas holidays, we have been exceptionally busy. So I'm sorry for the long delay. Hopefully, we'll be able to get back into doing them more frequently soon. So to start the new year, I thought we'd begin on a really positive note. And what we're going to do is to talk about how to be successful. How to be successful creating a product that delivers people a health benefit. And everyone wants to be successful. Um, we spent 28 years working in the business of food and health, advising companies, analyzing markets, creating case studies. And from that, we have been able to work out some of the tried and true steps that you can take if you want to create a successful new food product with health benefits. And I'm just going to go for seven today. These are my personal favorite seven. There are others, but this is the, the ones I like best. Okay, the seven things that you can do to be successful in 2024. Number one, understand the power of taking out the bad. Now, consumer interest in products that are, that are clean label and free from things that the consumer perceives as being bad for their health. That's been around and growing steadily for about 25 years. It started with consumers uh, wanting uh, brands to take out uh, artificial additives and preservatives, and that evolved to uh, rejecting artificial sweeteners. And then a percentage of consumers also wanted products uh, to avoid having gluten in them. And then it went on to removing ingredients with names that you wouldn't find in your kitchen cupboard. So all of these free-froms are seen by different groups of consumers as indicators of health, and they extend to a really significant menu. So what does that menu include? Well, for some people, free from dairy. For others, free from lactose. For others, free from sugar or no added sugar. That one's probably consistently the most popular and is the closest to being mass, whereas others perhaps have smaller audiences. Gluten-free. For others, grain-free, wheat-free, and all of those sorts of things, free from wheat and grain and dairy and lactose, a lot of that's to do with digestive wellness because obtaining good digestive wellness is interestingly one of the biggest drivers behind this push towards free-froms. But there are others, so more recently, fewer carbs, so less carbohydrates in a product. And then looking at packaging, uh, BPA-free, so in the sense of being a product being free from a potential harm that could result from plastic packaging. And the latest one, the one at the cutting edge, is, is free from seed oils or free from industrial oils. The list, of course, is significantly more extensive than that. Some of these are just driven by consumer belief, but some of them are, in fact, backed by science. And there's so many because people's views about health are today highly fragmented. We do not all share the one point of view that we shared 30 years ago. In a household, one person will be avoiding wheat, but another will enjoy bread. One person will avoid dairy, another enjoys Greek yogurt. So people select the beliefs that align with their, with their personal health needs and, and their personal health beliefs. And you, as the, someone taking a product to market, you don't have to address all of them. You just deliver on the ones that make sense for whatever type of product you're offering and make sense for your target consumer. You don't have to get into expensive reformulation. Well, you do sometimes, but if you can avoid it, it's not always necessary. So this actually requires you to spend a lot of time talking to humans and really understanding what free froms different people find motivating. Number two, understand that the internet is in charge. So I said in point one that people's beliefs about food and health become much more diverse. And this is why. The biggest change of the past 25 years is how dominant information on the web and in social media has become in the way that consumers think. And that's not going away. In fact, it may even just increase. More than 50% of 18 to 24 year olds in our own consumer research in five countries told us they get their information about food and health from social media. They don't just get it from social media first. That's the only place they go for it. For many young people, and I would go right up to kind of mid-30s, social media is already 
mainstream media. Some of you will have read recently in the business press about the huge number of job cuts in the US media in places like the Los Angeles Times and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and many others and TV stations. And that's because traditional media is dying. Its audiences are able to go elsewhere for their information. People are able to go and find information on the web from a variety of sources and from influencers on social media. So when it comes to food and health, like every other area, people have access to more information about nutrition than ever before in human history through the phone in their pocket. And they're able to do their own research and form their own views. Now, debates about nutrition science, the merits of consuming more fat or eating a low fat, for example, or consuming fewer carbohydrates, these all used to take place behind the closed doors of the university. And the average person rarely, if ever, got to hear about them. Today, those discussions are on people's phones. And they can also see that even within the professional and expert community, there's a lot of questioning about the advice that's been given about health in the past. People can discover the advice that they've taken seriously often had no or very weak scientific basis. And then that leads people to imagine that possibly the experts aren't to be trusted. So if you think we can go back to a time when there was some sort of belief that there's a single truth in nutrition and that there can be an expert and everyone believes an expert, I have bad news for you. The low quality of the evidence that the nutrition science profession used in the past for a lot of advice, which has resulted in that advice having to be changed or at least being challenged, that's really messed up the credibility of experts. Number three, and this one's for the technologists. If you want people to embrace your food technology, it must solve a problem. So I mentioned probiotic before. Probiotic dairy for digestive wellness solves a problem for the consumer. It enables them to have better digestive transit or whatever it is they're looking for. It's the reason that probiotic dairy for digestive wellness has done well for the past 30 years. It helps solve people's digestive discomfort problems. So that can be a simple kefir with lots of different bacteria. It can be something like a yakal with one particular strain, which is hugely successful across Asia and South America. But probiotics are, of course, a type of technology, but they're delivered in a cultured dairy product. And people have got accustomed to the idea over the past 30 plus years that you can have cultures in dairy and uh, much longer in some parts of the world and that they naturally belong in fresh dairy products. So the probiotic is indeed technology. There's a lot of science goes into researching many of the strains of, of uh, probiotics, like BB12, for example, but it's not perceived as being technology by the consumer. It's perceived as being natural and belonging naturally in a dairy product. And importantly, it solves a problem. Unfortunately, companies sometimes lose sight of this. Oat milk, for example, is made possible by enzyme technology. And that enzyme technology turns what would otherwise be lumpy porridge into a smooth, easy to drink beverage. But that is not known by the consumer. It's not on the label. We don't make the consumer eat enzymes. It's something that happens in the production process. The consumer has not got the technology of oat milk shoved in their face. We're not telling them to eat technology. What they see is oats and water. And it's very simple for them to embrace that. Because people don't like to eat technology, that's where all of the companies developing cell meat or lab meat are going badly wrong. As they start to commercialize, they will have to tell people that they're eating something, which is technology. And they'll have to explain what it is. And at that point, most people will be turned off. Humans are happy to fly in technology, drive technology, use it to call a friend, go to a meeting with 10 colleagues in five countries, heat their house, or technology from a pharma company that you zap into your body to fight a disease, but they don't eat it. Your product can be based on technology, but you have to figure out how that's going to be made acceptable to the majority of people. Number four, permission to indulge is what people want most. So I put this next to technology because I said people don't like to eat technology. What they do like is pleasure. They like taste and enjoyment. And one of the most effective strategies in food and health is to combine 
health benefits with indulgence. And that may seem like a contradiction, but it's not. Humans love to hear that something that is indulgent and pleasurable is also good for them. Let's take the example of dark chocolate. Chocolate was demonized in the past, in the 1970s and 80s, for being full of sugar and full of fat. But once the message started to become more widely known that dark chocolate may actually have some health benefits, and I suspect a lot of people didn't really know what they were, sales of dark chocolate began to increase. It gave people permission to indulge because it had perceived health benefits. And then, of course, dark chocolate further gained because as people became more concerned about sugar, that gave them further permission to eat dark chocolate because it tends to be lower in sugar. Sometimes it's like 85% cocoa, for example, is very low in sugar. And permission to indulge works across most categories. Mondelez, one of the giant food companies, really excels at this strategy. You've probably all heard of Oreos, the world's biggest cookie brand. Well, Mondelez has a variant called Oreo Thins. It's a smaller, lighter, thinner version of Oreos. So if you have one, it has half the sugar, half the calories, half the fat, and so on and so forth. And what it means is that people can indulge in having the Oreo that they love the taste of, but at the same time feel better about their choice because they have, they're having just half of all the things they want to avoid. Number five, keep it simple. This overlaps, I have to admit, with number one, but it's a, a little bit different. You know, if you look around at the successes of the past 10 years, to even longer, actually 20 years, they tend to be pretty straightforward, simple, easy to understand products. Greek yogurt, for example, pioneered by Chobani in the, the United States, it's pretty simple. It's milk that's been strained, it's been fermented, and it tastes delicious. Um, huge success uh, in the United States in the cottage cheese market. Cottage cheese is a very, very simple type of food. And Daisy Dairy is one brand there, which has uh, grown enormously. I think sales are up 20% last year, just on the basis of no added things, nothing bad put into it, simple product, easy to understand. Oat milk. Oat milk has grown hugely because people see it as just oats and water. It's simple. Though, of course, as I explained just now, it's only made possible by food technology, just that no one's telling the consumer to eat the technology. And if you want to look at a real success um, in plant-based, for example, don't look at burgers and sausages, none of which have done very well. Look at pickles, the humble pickle. Sales in the US of pickles in 2016 were a billion dollars. There's this boring traditional category. In 2023, it risen to 3.5, 3.5 billion dollars. That's a phenomenal growth. They were presented in more interesting packaging, with more flavors, in more convenient forms, more snackable, but essentially still a simple product, the pickle. And that is really what consumers want most. Number six, take the time to understand food culture. Now, what do I mean by this term food culture? Well, what you eat and what you believe and where you live are not separate things. They are all aspects of culture, your culture. So food culture relates, uh, when it talks about what people eat, it's about why they eat it, how they eat it, when they eat it. It relates to foods produced by companies that people choose in the supermarket, as well as foods consumed in the home. It covers beliefs about foods and their health benefits, and they, they vary widely across the world. It covers cooking styles. Uh, not many people in the West have rice cookers, for example, and not many people in Japan have bread makers. It relates to how something's processed and everything to do with eating habits. So food and culture are intimately related to each other. That's absolutely unavoidable. People's broader social beliefs have a big impact on the, how they think about food. If you think about Italy, Food is a defining part of Italian culture. Italian culture has created a very distinctive style of eating, one that's globally popular. Culture and food are closely related. In Italy, they influence one another. And this is the same for Japan, France, even the US and every other country. So food technology and food brands and food products do not float free from food culture. Marketers often overlook this. It's great to do some consumer research, but that's not really understanding the consumer. That's taking you about 10% of the way there. If you really want to understand the consumer, you have to really get into understanding their culture. 
the food industry, food marketers and product developers have over the past 10 to 15 years failed to pay enough attention to food culture. If you're introducing any food, any new product of any kind, it pays to understand the people. And these cultural differences have little wrinkles in them in the real world in terms of the results they have. So the Brits, for example, love Mondelez breakfast cookies, which are 20% sugar. The Swedes, on the other hand, are not so keen. They don't buy anything like as many as the Brits, because traditionally, a savoury breakfast is part of the Swedish eating culture, not a sweet one. Food culture means that Germans are eagerly eating plant-based meat substitutes, even while Americans are turning away from them and the market there is declining. Well, why is that? America has a long tradition of eating beef. There's a lot of very high quality beef raised in the United States. It is a strong part of American food culture. Germany does not have that tradition. It's a densely populated country. Pork is the most consumed meat. And in particular, Germans consume it in huge quantities of what are essentially ultra-processed dishes like sausages, emulsified sausages, put together with all sorts of things. These are not high quality products. And I can say this, some of my family is German, so I know just how bad German food can be. Germans do not have the familiarity with high quality meat, such as beef, that you find in countries like the US, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the UK or France. So because they're used to consuming low quality meat, it's not such a big step for them to consume plant-based meat substitutes, which also often have difficult flavors and textures and so on and so forth. It's a very short step. So the food culture helps explain why plant-based meat substitutes continue to do well in Germany, even as they're rejected in other countries. So again, if you're a German, please don't be offended. I'm related to Germans. I can see what's going on. So in summary, difficult as it is, you have to make having a deep understanding of food culture as much part of your strategy as consumer research and everything else. Particularly true now when people's beliefs about food and health have become so fragmented. Number seven, we've got there at last. Understand who you are targeting. New um, products for health and new ideas about health emerge and are embraced, first of all, by the by early adopters. We tend to refer to them in our work as the lifestyle consumers. And who do we mean by that? Well, we mean the 25 to 30% of the population who prioritize making healthy choices when they do their shopping. And they will prioritize that over budget. It depends on the country. Some countries it's bigger than 30%, some less. They're often people who have higher levels of disposable income. They tend to skew towards higher educational levels. They also tend to skew older because when people are older, and their children have left home, they have a bit more money and a bit more time to spend doing the necessary business of looking after their health. So the lifestyle consumer, they are the early adopters of oat milk, of consuming more blueberries, of turmeric lattes, of matcha lattes, and pretty much every health concept you can think of. It's very unusual for a new health concept to bypass the early adopters and go straight into the mass market. Because these people are interested in health, they research and embrace new ingredients, new benefits, and new foods. In commercial terms, this is a low volume, but higher value segment of the market because people will pay a lot more in this part of the market. Now, the majority of the population, that's the other 60 plus, 60% 60 plus, well, they've got mortgages to pay, and car loans to pay, and kids to bring up and take to school. They have a household budget to manage. They have to work very hard. They don't necessarily are having the luxury of looking around for the coolest thing, and they may not be willing to spend their hard-earned dollars on it. There are some that do, but it's not the larger part. You can talk to the lifestyle consumer about your new and interesting brand with its new and interesting benefits, and you can do that in a way that you can't talk to the mass market consumer who is too busy and too constrained by time to take on board your clever new idea. And unfortunately, the landscape is covered in the carcasses of companies who try to ignore that basic reality of targeting the right people and being patient. For 20 or 25 years, people have tried to jump straight to the mass market. Unless your ingredient and the benefit are things that the mass consumer can easily embrace and understand, don't do that. So finally, I hope you found this short walk through the seven factors for success to be helpful. And as I say, these are just my personal favorites. 
I wish you every success with your new product developments in 2024. And thank you for listening to this podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please press the like button if you can find it. Go to our website, www.new-nutrition.com, where you will find a wealth of information which will help you understand the whole business of food, nutrition, and health. And it'll be even more useful than this podcast has been. And I guarantee you'll enjoy it as well. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for taking the time out to listen to this. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.